I would uh, uh, like to welcome you to this uh, wonderful tutorial on uh, on chip memories, challenges, opportunities, and recent advances, uh, in which the uh, speakers, tutors are uh, Professor Manan Surya of IIT Delhi and Professor Anuj Brogra of Triple IIT Delhi. Uh, I've had the privilege of knowing these uh, two gentlemen for a long time, and it's uh, my pleasure and privilege to know them and to learn uh, this uh, difficult subject from them. Dr. Anuj Grover is Associate Dean of uh, Industrial Relations and Associate Professor in the Department of uh, Electronics and Communication Engineering at the IIIT Delhi in the Prasthan Institute of Information Technology. He also is a great innovator and chairs the Institute Innovation Council. Uh, he will uh, <coughs> introduce himself uh, in, uh, during, his, uh, uh, during his presentation at the uh, uh, opportune moment. Uh, and uh, my esteemed colleague uh, in uh, IIT Delhi, uh, Dr. Manan Suri, uh, is, uh, he's the leader of the non-volatile memories and neuromorphic hardware research group at IIT Delhi. Uh, his research institute uh, interests include semiconductor non-volatile memory technology and its uh, advanced applications in neuromorphic, artificial intelligence, security computing, and sensing. Again, uh, he's a globally recognized figure and a deep tech uh, innovator. Uh, he will uh, introduce himself to, uh, to greater uh, depth during his talk. So without wasting further time, I would like to hand over to Dr. Anuj Grover. Dr. Grover, will you please take over? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kaushik, for introducing me and for your kind words. Uh, we will move to the presentation right away. So. Uh, as you already know, the title of our presentation of this tutorial today is On Chip Memories, Challenges, Opportunities, and Recent Advances. This tutorial is jointly being jointly conducted by me and uh, Professor Manan Suri from IIT Delhi. Uh, the way we plan the tutorial is that I will take the first part of the tutorial where we will talk about embedded SRAM design challenges and opportunities. This session will be about 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, while I would encourage you to ask questions if you have any during the session also. Uh, we will also have a dedicated Q&A uh, time after the session. Then Dr. Manan will take over and he will talk about NVM design challenges and opportunities. And uh, likewise, there is a 35 to 40 minutes window in which he will talk and then there will be a 5 to 10 minutes window of question and answers. So let's start with part one. And let me begin with introducing myself. My name is Dr. Anuj, uh, and uh, I've been working in VLSI design for more than 21 years now, of which more than 18 years has been with ST Microelectronics. I have multiple patents and papers in my name, and my primary area of research is circuits and systems, memory design. Uh, these days I am focusing heavily on in-memory compute, and we'll talk about it later. And I also work on safety and security in hardware. Amongst my other interests, I'm interested in innovation, leadership, well-being, self-growth, and I'm also a TRIS Level 3 certified practitioner. So TRIS is a technique for inventor problem solving, and uh, uh, I, I really enjoy using TRIS. Uh, if you wish to reach out to me, my web page, email address, and uh, YouTube uh, link are there on the, on the site as of now. Uh, before we go further, let us, uh, you know, answer this question for ourselves. Uh, or, or, in fact, let me just introduce IIIT Delhi also to you. It's a state university established by the government of Delhi in 2008 and has been ranked well uh, by different uh, ranking agencies over the past few years. Uh, it has seven BTEC programs and eight MTEC programs uh, with specializations in uh, VLSI and embedded systems as one of the uh, one of the ones in MTech programs. Uh, we have PhD programs across six departments, and uh, if there are students who are interested in pursuing PhD, I can assure you, Triple IIT Delhi is a is a good place to be in. Uh, yeah, before we start, let us look at why this tutorial in the first place. You know, why why are we even talking about embedded memories and uh, uh, you know, the challenges or the opportunities that exist there. Uh, many of you may have seen that across the memory, across the hierarchy of the compute systems that we use, processors, 
there is a wide range of memories that exist there are on chip registers which are right there in the data path and then there are level 1 caches level 2 caches and so on until we go to off chip main memory drams and off chip non volatile disks um in recent times uh, non volatile memories have also gone on chip and that is where uh, manan's uh, research area and that is where we will also talk about non non on chip non volatile memories also today and uh, when we say that memories are all over the place uh, it's not it's not just a, a statement per se uh, a quick look at one of the recent chips let us say uh, amd chip called ryzen would show you would uh, indicate to you that uh, there is a vast area uh, of the chip that is being occupied by the uh, that is being occupied by the memories in fact you will see that uh, up to 70% of chip area in advanced uh, digital socs is uh, consumed by memories hmm? uh, let me just take a moment to share that slide with you just give me a second so srams in those terms uh, on chip srams are a, a major part of any digital soc and uh, this in itself is a, a reason enough for us to look into uh, into this uh, tutorial with with sufficient interest hmm? for example uh, this all this pink region in the center in fact all this region is l3 caches over here you have l2 cache regions and all this is l1 cache this is l1 cache so if you if you just look at it this is a huge chip real estate that memories occupy a small error anywhere can mean that the entire chip is simply thrown away that is the importance of srams and that is the importance of on chip memories in today's designs so what are we going to look at today in the beginning we will look at sram design the architecture 60 cell operation and verification challenges and opportunities and then as i mentioned one of my uh, recent uh, and key interests is in memory compute we we'll also look at some details of what in memory compute means uh, what does von neumann bottleneck mean then the key design choices and uh, uh, and recent results uh, and recent experiments and results from across the world will also be summarized towards the end mm -hmm. so typically any memory is organized like this there is a array of storage elements and then there are peripheral circuits decoders ios multiplexers which would enable any user to access this array of storage elements the memory operation essentially involves uh, you know uh, a input clock and some addressing scheme when the clock arrives internal clocks are generated addresses are pre decoded and they go into what is called as post decoders the decoder region once uh, the clock reaches the post decoder region we generate what is called as a word line the word line selects memory cells and i'm i'm showing a differential memory cell over here when the memory cell is selected the bit lines so these are the pairs of bit lines in there they discharge a differential voltage appears between the bit lines and then we have what is called as a sense amplifier that is activated and the output is made available to the user this is the typical read operation in a sram now we may have many more uh, additional features we could have test features we could have uh, security or debuggability features also added in it, but this is the core read operation in an sram which is enabled by what is what is called as a 
60 memory cells. In fact, SRAMs could have uh, different kinds of memory cells, but six transistor memory cell is the most common one. A six transistor memory cell is, is, is essentially a latch, uh, which has uh, pull-up BMOSs and pull-down NMOSs, and then a pair of excess transistors through which the information inside the memory cell is transmitted onto the bit lines. Let us have a quick look at how the memory cell operates. Initially, the bit lines are pre-charged to a particular level. Let us say, assume it to be VDD for now. When the world line goes high, the side where zero is stored discharges, and the side on which one was stored does not discharge because the bit lines were already pre-charged to high. There is no VDS across this device. So this doesn't discharge. The differential that appears between the bit line and bit line bar is then amplified through a circuit known as sense amplifier in the IO region. This appears to be very simple operation, doesn't it? However, it's not as simple in the sense that there are challenges involved. The first challenge is that of stability. See, uh, when we say that there is a zero stored here and we take word line to a high level, uh, what we are essentially meaning to say is that some current will flow due to which bit line will discharge. Now for flow of any current to happen, this zero has to go to some value other than zero so that there is some VDS across this device, the pull down device. Otherwise there can be no flow of current. Hmm? What that means is that when we are reading, there is a kind of a potential divider that is getting formed between bit line and ground voltage. You do not want Vx or the, in, the node at the voltage at this node to go very high, else the, the latch would flip, the contents of the memory cell would get corrupted. So to, to ensure that the stability of the cell is maintained, this resistance should be high. That is the excess transistor should be resistive. Hmm? Now that is one criteria or one need that we have. But we also want to improve performance. What that means is that the read current needs to be increased, which means that the excess transistor should be more conductive. At a different level, we may also say that the capacitance needs to be reduced. So the excess transistor needs to be smaller or we could use hierarchical bit lines or word lines, architecture level solutions to achieve high performance. But do you realize that over here we have conflicting requirements? We also want to have the excess transistor be, become resistive, while at the same time we want it to be more conductive. So how do we handle it? We will see. Let's first look at the write operation also. When we want to write into the memory cell, now as you notice initially, we have a zero written on this side and one written on the other side. When we want to write the other data, so what this means is I would probably want to write a zero on the other cell, other side and one on this side. So what we do is we take the, the side on which we want to write a zero, the bit line on that side to zero. So BL remains at one while BL bar has gone to zero. Now, when the word line goes on, the internal node over here discharges through the bit line. And then after this has discharged, the other internal node gets pre-charged to one, gets charged to one. And that is how the write operation happens. This also appears to be simple. However, there is a challenge here too. The challenge is that we want uh, to, to be able to accomplish this write operation successfully. We want that any current that is coming from this pull-up device should be less than the current that we are discharging through the excess transistor. So there is a ratio of sizing of the pull-up device and the excess transistor that is required. In fact, this pull-up device in, in, in most advanced technologies, you will notice that this pull-up device is probably the most resistive device that you will make in the technology. This device not only has the minimum width, but also has larger length than the minimum length prescribed by the technology. So this is a very resistive device. An immediate consequence of resistive device, resistive PMOS is that when I need to charge the other node, 
to VDD, this PMOS is weak. Essentially, this has a direct impact on write time, that is the speed of the memory. So again, we have a conflicting requirement where we want the pull-up transistor to be resistive, but for performance purposes, I want it to be more conductive. The way to handle these kinds of conflicts has been two-pronged. The first has been people have proposed different topology cells, different cell topologies. If you open IEEE Explore or, and just search about SRAM cells, you will see SRAM cell topologies, 60, as I just told you, you will also see denser topologies, but uh, to reduce the complexity of the cell you will, or complexity of operation, you will see there are topologies proposed from anything from seven transistors to 18 transistor memory cells. This obviously means much larger area. If 70 to 80% of your die area is SRAMs, putting larger area is, you know, shooting yourself in your foot. In, uh, in my lectures on SRAMs uh, at IIIT, I very commonly tell my students that, you know, for VLSI, area is gold. For VLSI designers, area is gold. You just don't want to lose any area. But for SRAM designers, area is diamond. It is, it is absolutely uh, prohibited to give up area in SRAMs. So while there are these topologies of 12 transistors or, or 18 transistors or 14 transistors or anything, anything like that, uh, larger area is, is actually a big no-no. So what is usually done is, that we apply what are called as electrical read and write assist schemes. See, uh, did you notice I did not say that you have to have a smaller pass, a smaller excess transistor or a larger excess transistor. I simply said we need to make them more resistive or less resistive. Since these are transistors and they are controlled transistors, we have the control gate with us. We can electrically modulate their behavior. We can electrically change their characteristics to make them more resistive or less resistive. So uh, these electrical assist schemes are applied onto SRAM arrays to enable uh, successful read and write operations in advanced technologies. Uh, some of the common read assist schemes are word line underdrive, in which case the word line is not taken to a full VDD level. Now, what would happen if you do not take word line to a full VDD level? The pass gate will become resistive. The excess transistor will become resistive. As the excess transistor becomes resistive, your stability improves. But what goes for the toss? The read current. So the performance goes for a toss. If you don't want to do that, then what you can do? You can, instead of giving a continuous word line, you can give pulsed word line. So you give multiple pulses of word line where word line goes to full VDD. Uh, in, this, in which case, the, while the cell starts to become unstable, you've disconnected the word line. So the cell becomes stable again. Then you turn it on again. It discharges the bit line further. Then, it take, then you turn it off before it starts to become unstable. Uh, complex. But yes, it's a, it's a read assist scheme which is proposed uh, and probably also used at some places in the industry. Pre-discharged bit lines is another scheme where we say that the voltage that you apply across the potential divider of trans excess transistor and pull down in itself is less, which ensures that the noise injected into the memory cell is reduced. Similarly, you have regenerative sensing in which the sense amplifier writes back into the memory cell. You have supply boost, power intensive scheme, and negative VSS schemes also. You will notice that for write operation, uh, so while for read operation, for read assist, we wanted to underdrive the word line. For, for write operations, we want to give a boost to the word line so that the excess transistor is faster. You are you're able to, uh, so that the excess transistor has more strength than the pull-up. So they are contrary to each other. When you want to read and ensure stability, you want word line to be underdriven, whereas when you want to read, the word line needs to be boosted. The most commonly used write assist scheme, though, is 
negative bit line. So bit line is taken to a level lower than zero so that you can successfully accomplish the right operation. There are also schemes like multi-level modulated word lines where the word line is initially underdriven. Uh, you wait for bit line to discharge a bit, then uh, you overdrive it and you ensure that the right operation completes. There are schemes like supply lowering, data dependent body modulation. So in technologies like FDSOI, uh, you can also control the fourth terminal of the device, which is the body terminal. And that can give you a significant advantage and speed up. Uh, if you design the cells, if you design the memory cell well and use the appropriate technology levers, you can see that the body modulation can be a cheaper technique than, for example, modulating the supply voltage in terms of VSS or, uh, or the bulk otherwise. Okay. So uh, with, with new levers coming in, you have uh, more ways to assist uh, read and write operations inside the memory cell. <sighs> the story doesn't end there. Uh, I, I believe many of you must have seen this kind of a distribution. This is the famous Gaussian distribution. What it says is that uh, any, any random process, if it's a natural process, can be described through a Gaussian distribution, through a distribution which is Gaussian in nature. We have uh, a mean value of the distribution, which is where we probably targeted our operation, our manufacturing process. And then uh, the distribution is characterized by the standard distribution and uh, the standard deviation. And for a Gaussian distribution, within plus minus one sigma of the mean, we know that 68.2% samples exist. Uh, within two sigma, we have more than 95% of samples. And by ensuring that we, we are qualifying the design plus minus three sigma, we ensure that 99.7% of the samples are very taken care of. So do you think this is sufficient when we talk about SRAMs and the read and write operations in SRAMs? Let us just put in some numbers. If I say that uh, the, the typical on-chip capacity of an SRAM is of a, you know, on-chip SRAM capacity on a chip is one megabit. Now, one megabit is too small. Uh, you already, like in advanced technologies like 7-fin uh, uh, pet or 14-fin uh, uh, pet, you already would see that uh, on-chip, uh, a typical, uh, a typical uh, digital sock would have an on-chip memory which is greater than 32 megabit or 64 megabit. But let's for now just assume that we have one megabit on-chip capacity. So how many memory cells are we talking about? Okay, for the sake of simplicity, let us say 10 raised to power six. So there are 10 raised to power six memory cells. And if I qualify stability criteria for plus minus three sigma of the cells, the failure rate is 0.3%. Am I right? So 0.3% of cells would fail. Sounds to be very less. But what that means in terms of a one megabit SRAM capacity is that on every die, you will have 3000 failures. So your chip yield will be 0%. This is absolutely unacceptable. So if you just put in these numbers, hmm, you will see that to qualify anything, anything like 16 megabit or, or higher, you need to have at least plus minus six sigma qualification on your read stability criteria and writability criteria. Plus minus six sigma, let it sink in. If you want to verify any memory circuit, for plus minus six sigma of variations, how would you verify it? See, the typical uh, statistical analysis methods involve Monte Carlo simulations. Hmm? If you put random variations on say, VTN mobility of all the devices and see the impact on parameters of interest, for example, over here, uh, noise margin or writability, you need 30 to 60 simulations to validate within one sigma. 
okay if you want to validate six sigma or plus minus six sigma you will need more than one billion simulations this is not a cost that you can you as a designer can pay when you are iterating and designing the memory cell so specifically for sram design there have been and there are uh, there are current uh, uh, there is also ongoing research there there is uh, the concept of for example important sampling where after the first few initial simulations with random variations we estimate the sensitivity of the output parameters to the input variations and then we learn on the fly and continuously aggregate the variations to achieve risky samples so while over here i said that you will need something like 10 9 10 to power 9 samples uh, when you go to important sampling you could probably do with 10 to the power 4 to 5 samples to talk of plus minus six sigma qualification that is also not a small number can we do better and for that there are still more advanced methods which is which are based on what is called as design of experiments in which uh inputs the the input variations are given uh sequentially one by one and their impact on the output variables output parameters is observed and we estimate the good functionality contours in terms of sigma extents where we say that uh, and, and and practically so uh, the vt variations across different devices in the, inside the memory cell are independent of each other so we say that uh, the variations of uh, vt across the devices are independent and we just do a root mean square sum of these variations and we then integrate it to estimate the yield when you go to doe kind of an approach you could probably do well with something like 10 to the power 3 samples do you see uh, are you able to sense the kind of uh, uh, impact even cad validation schemes could have on design cycle time it is the intelligence for sram designers the intelligence need not go only in sizing the devices or only in uh ensuring some uh, parameters four or five parameters around the memory cell as an sram designer if you if you intend to become one uh, you also need to look at various other aspects including verification and how to speed up that verification uh, in fact i would not say only as an sram designer any memory designer would need to look into all these aspects <laughs> let me take you through another journey in asrams we also have what is called as a replica path you remember this this figure that i showed you just a little while back where we said that the clock would come and we would generate the word line the differential would appear and we would activate the sense amplifier in my previous part of the discussion i had consciously not talked about what would activate the sense amplifier see the sense amplifier is an is a analog circuit is an amplifier which has its own offset to do the correct read operation it is necessary that the differential that appears on this pair of bit lines is higher than the offset requirement of the sense amplifier what that means is that we need to somehow track the worst case cells you know this cell would probably be selected last in terms of word line selection and would have the longest delay for before sen arrives so what we do is we add what is called as a replica path to track the worst case the output of the replica path is used to trigger the sense amplifier a key design optimization or a d a key design verification that is needs required is that this san arrival should happen only after there is sufficient differential appearing on the bit lines here graphically i can represent it like this this is the differential voltage distribution from the bit lines 
and this is the sense amplifier offset requirement what is essentially required is that the minimum differential voltage that appears on the bit lines should be greater than the sense amplifier offset requirement this would ensure that there are no failures hmm? however as the technology is scaling what happens the mismatch increases as the mismatch increases what happens the sense amplifier offset requirement increases as technology scales there is another thing that happens the memory cell also shrinks as the memory cell shrinks the current that it can drive reduces so we see that the differential voltage distribution curve starts to come closer to the sense amplifier offset requirement but that's not all while the current reduces the mismatch increases also for the memory cell what does this mean this means that there is ease loss that will happen we don't want that to happen so what do you do you try to push this curve out how do you push this curve out you can push this curve out by adding more delays into the replica path where you see where you say that you will trigger the sense amplifier a little later when you trigger the sense amplifier a little later this curve naturally shifts a little to the right but that means performance goes for a toss tell me one thing when you purchase your new laptop or your new cell phone do you expect that the performance of the new laptop or the new cell phone would be worse than the previous generation one no as a consumer we want whatever new electronic products we purchase they should operate faster and more efficiently than the previous generation products so we need to do something about the verification approach also so in 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 our team we actually observed that uh the the distribution actually you know this edge this edge which we have assumed gaussian till now is actually not gaussian and in fact we could actually achieve better yield than what the gaussian assumption proves or what the gaussian assumption gives us and therefore we need to go into advanced statistics of what is called as extreme value theory and look at what is the minimum current in a particular bit slice that is engaging with a sense amplifier by use of extreme value theory that is advanced statistical method we are able to recover yield uh, at faster performance so we were able to demonstrate that you could improve performance by up to 7% by just changing the verification method so as a sram designer you need to look into various aspects of memory design not just sizing the circuits now that was that was still sram design and now i come to the last part of my presentation where i want to tell you know share with you uh the need for what we call as in memory compute these days see von neumann architecture based processors uh access memories when they need to uh do some computation so the memories are accessed for getting data the compute happens in the processor and then the data is sent back to the memory let us say we wanted to do an operation of a plus b is equal to c or c is equal to a plus b what do you do you say you give the first instruction you say load a the instruction goes to the sram and the sram sends data into the processor then you give the second instruction you say load b the second instruction goes to the bus to the sram sram sends the second set of data to the processor the the processor does the addition path a new data is generated and then you launch another instruction which then sends another set of data to the memory for writing operation so for just one instruction we needed to interact with the memory six times as we go into 
you know, big data applications as we go into applications like neural networks, large scale GPU, big GPUs and so on. Uh, there are so many instructions and so many data interactions that the throughput of your processor gets limited by the bandwidth that the bus offers you. This limitation of bandwidth is referred to as von Neumann bot bottleneck. How do we find a solution to it? The solution around it is what we call as in-memory compute. If we have an in-memory compute capable SRAM or a memory, all that this processor needs to do is it needs to give the instruction C is equal to A plus B. The memory would access location A, access location B, generate the output C, and then automatically store it at a location C inside itself. The kind of uh, interaction required through this bus reduces so significantly. So now your entire throughput improves. The power that you would have wasted in transmitting data to and fro from the memory to the processor that is saved. And you have a much more efficient memory system. That is what is in-memory compute. Uh, but what does it require? To enable in-memory compute, you clearly need to have an advanced in-memory control engine. You also need to see which functions to implement inside the memory. It's not very simple. While add, subtract, and probably multiply operations can be easily implemented inside the memory, convolution involves much more uh, juggling. Then there could be some application dependent function also. For example, an image processor would require something like a transpose function or a shift function or a complement function. You would need compare functions, you would need shift functions, you would need rotate functions and so on. So which of these functions do you want to put inside the memory is a question that you have to ask yourself when you want to enable in-memory compute. Another key question to ask is, do you really need to put the function inside the memory? Or can you just place it somewhere near the memory? If you still place it near the memory, you do not need to access the processor. And you still are able to bypass the von Neumann bottleneck. These questions are not simple to answer. They're not simple to answer, but there are many more questions that need to be answered. For example, do you want single bit operations or multi bit operation? Do you want serial compute or parallel compute? Answers to each of these decisions has an imp important impact on the power, performance, and area of the entire system, compute system that you are building. Whether you want to play fully digital or you want to go to analog and next signal mode, all these things you as a designer need to take care of. So while there are these many questions, are there any answers also? We are working to find answers. Numerous experiments are happening. If you look at any recent uh, publication, you know, recent runs of the conferences like ISSCC or VLSI Symposium or anything, you will see there are full new tracks on in-memory compute. Uh, there are innovations which are about bit cells, we talk about read and write decoupled cells. Again, you increase the size of the memory cell. Uh, you go to 80, 90, 10 T cells, even bigger ones. Uh, you are also talking about capacitive decoupled cells. Again, 80 with capacitive coupling to 10 T with capacitive coupling, 12 T with capacitive coupling. And you will notice that each of these schemes has its own benefits. Twin 80 cells enable two bit uh, two-bit waiting, you know, two-bit waits inside your memory cell itself. Transpose 8T cells have been proposed to enable cross-point computes and even transpose functions, for example, for imaging applications. So many more innovations are happening across the store itself. And when Manan will take over, he will talk about more innovations in the non-volatile domain and how non-volatile memories are also innovating on the memory cell and the cross-point computations to enable faster, more energy efficient computes. There are innovation happenings on the row decoder side also. 
road decoder was always considered to be a very simple circuit a simple address decoding circuit but today it's not just that when you talk of in memory compute you need to talk about parallel row selection to increase the throughput you you need to you there are there are experiments about changing the word line on duration again to enable multiple bits so that the word line on duration is dependent on the feature vector that you want to calculate dynamic pulse word lines again enabling multi bit how many pulses you send on the word line would define how the bit line would discharge analog levels on the word line again to enable multi bit where the level of the word line is dependent on the feature vector and so on so many more experiments are happening there are also innovations happening on the bit line and the sensing side very commonly you will see that bit lines are used as accumulators dacs are being used for weighted weighted bit line precharge adcs with weighted capacitor banks are being integrated into the memory so the simple sense amplifiers last type sense amplifiers no longer work you need to add much more to that Simultaneously, you'll see there are also architecture level innovations. For example, for signed bit computations, there are separate bit lines for addition, subtractions, different parts of the array, or a bit slice doing these different computations, and then some logic at the in the I/O periphery to merge them. Different bit slices for doing different bit multi-bit computations. Again, bit serial parallel compute paradigms, loading of for loading of feature data and weights inside the memory. a lot of things are happening and no wonder we also are seeing a, a wide range of results uh early on initially uh, you know something about 4 5 years back uh people were only looking at tops for what as a figure of merit and you would see that there are you know tops per watt range from 28 to 351 and mind you they are not technology dependent or while this this figure is technology dependent it is not that uh, 20 uh, uh, 28.1 at 65 would translate to a higher value or 130 or a lower value at a uh, at a lower technology node just uh, technology scaling could give you some benefits in terms of top support but you will notice that architectural changes can give you bigger benefits in more recent times tops per millimeter square was also introduced because we noticed in the previous section that there are many architectural decisions that could have an area impact when you talk about uh, improved performance this is not all you will see that uh, in when you when you look at more papers you will see that people are talking about tops per watt performance of more than 600 700 tops per watt i have also seen papers exceeding 1100 tops per watt and there are comparisons across different domains where we also uh, bring in terms of what kind of configurability or dimensionality your solution offers so all these decisions that you make about in memory compute can have a significant impact on the final system no wonder the jury is still out we do not know what will be the final set of architectures of in memory compute that will be there in the industry the industry is still just looking with awe and uh, curiosity as to where the things are settling but the field is still very raw a lot of research is happening here and in fact i myself have three students working on in memory compute as of now so with that i kind of close my presentation if there are some questions um, i will be happy to take them up uh, ishita are there any questions for dr grover so i see one question which is about how the peripheral and bit cell design changes or trends when the node moves to finfit technologies so uh, the finfit technologies are, are for real and you, you already have finfits in your cell phones today hmm? uh, you still have 60 cells uh, you have all these various variants of cells also but 60 cells are still the most commonly used the peripheral circuits have also evolved a bit but there are other challenges that come with advanced technologies which were not there in the earlier ones for example new kinds of post layout effects start to appear 
new kinds of uh, things like how do you dissipate the power in a 3d setting uh how do you apply body modulation in a 3d setting and so on so wide range of uh, those uh, things are appearing and solutions are evolving to handle those challenges uh no, thank you for the answer uh, dr grover uh, are there any other questions i can't see any all right good so uh, i would like to uh, extend special thanks to uh, dr grover for this uh, enlightening uh, uh, lecture it has opened up quite a few doors for me too and i hope to collaborate with him to do good, good things in the future this is quite exciting thank you professor koshak